this is history in Genesis, and you cannot make this stuff up. It, uh, a lot of times would appear better than what many people would call almost like a soap opera or a plot, and, and the thing just gets all twisted and mangled, but this is real life, what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here so many times in this chapter is the lack of what we saw with Abraham and Sarah and what we saw all the way back to history with even Adam and Eve. That we don't believe God. We do not believe his promises so many times. And it's interesting how that affects us. We become, as I prayed, we become sleepy, we become disinterested in God's word. We therefore are left to our own devices to think in the flesh, to conclude things in the flesh, to act in the flesh. Yes, even as believers, we can do this. We can stray. Perhaps some of you have done it so long that you don't even recognize faith and God's promises in you. That you've not been walking with the Lord for so long that you become used to lies, deceit, manipulation, cunning. And if even if somebody was to, another brother and sister was to point it out in you, you immediately become defensive, become angry, you become demanding, you become all these things Instead of taking a look at your own heart and your own life and saying, maybe these things are true. Maybe I have really strayed. You see, this is why we really need to be in the body of Christ, in the body of Christ in church and being real with one another. Not a nuisance to one another, but real with one another. Sister, the way you have approached this, brother, the way you have approached this, and to humbly listen and to humbly hear because one thing that we need to understand and confess to the Lord, oh Lord, how easily I stray. Oh Lord, how easily I go aside from your will to do things of my own making. Oh Lord, how I have often so much loved your blessings more than I have ever loved you. Instead of the, your grace and your blessings and your mercy drawing me closer to you, I take them as if now I can continue to live my own life the way I want. It comes out in our responses to each other. How do you husbands respond to your wife? Do you love them? Are you kind to them? Are you leading them spiritually? Or are you just tired of your wife? Because you don't like the way she talks. You don't like the way she acts. You don't like the way she does things. So therefore, I do not need to lead you spiritually because of the things that you have done to me. Perhaps wives even sometimes saying, I don't like the way he treats me. I don't like the way th the things he does. Even the little things aggravate me now. Even the small things are the things that bring make, make me have contempt for him. And so therefore, you do not respect your husband as God has commanded. You do not follow your husband. You do not encourage your husband to be the, even the man of God that he needs to be. And as we said, you can't nag him into the kingdom of heaven. You can't nag him to be a godly man. Do you pray? Husbands, do you pray? Children, I wonder how often we manipulate our parents so that we can have our own way and to do things our own way, and to use sometimes even our parents to pit them one against another, seeing a fault line in the middle of their marriage, taking advantage in every way that you can. You see, when we do not obey the Lord, you see where we go even in the family? It becomes catastrophic. It becomes one against another. It becomes, if you want me to be happy with you and to love you, you must do things my way or I will not. And you hold your spouse or your kids 
hostage based on what you want and not what the will of God is. This is a story that is going on here. That is the story of so many different marriages. That if I don't get things my way, then I will not have you. And I will, as it were, abandon you emotionally, maybe even physically, in every way. But my love and care for you because you did not do things the way I wanted them done. The will of God has no concern for me. The will of God is no, has no value whatsoever to me. Only my way. And if you will not do it my way, then you will have none of the blessing that I can give you. Isn't it to a point to where we even have to come to the conclusion? How dare we withhold the blessing of God because of our own sinful desires, our own fleshly desires? And to only give blessings to those who can benefit us. If you do not benefit me, I have no blessing for you. If you do not create some kind of blessing in my life that causes me joy and happiness, then I have no need for you. How opposite Jesus acted on this. And how opposite this family, this family who are a covenant family of God, receiving the covenant of God, the promises of God, and yet every time, just like in all of history, there's cursings and blessings, and there's consequences here. But one of the things that we will definitely bring out in this in every way, you will begin to see the mercies of God in spite of our sin. You will see that God and his promises will not be thwarted even because of my own hard head, my own stiff neck. And in the end, I say, and I can hold it up to God and say, I did it my way. But you will see God graciously continue how these things work. So there was a promise to Rebecca because a civil war was going on in her womb. The babies were fighting. Even in the womb. You say, as we said last week, you say, well, they were just babies. They didn't know what they were doing. Yep, there's miraculous things that happen even with John the Baptist when he was in the presence of Jesus in Elizabeth's womb. And as Mary came with Jesus in her womb and John the Baptist leapt, as it were, for joy. There was a prophecy of who Jesus was and that John the Baptist would be the one preparing the way. So even here, there were two babies that would be indicative of their whole lives, one against another. Genesis 25, 23, when Rebecca goes before the Lord and says, why is this happening in me? And the Lord tells her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other and the others shall be shall serve the younger. How opposites these are. That although there are two people in the way that God works out his blessings and his promises, he says, though there is two people and, and these two people shall be divided, Edom and Israel. The one shall be stronger than the other, meaning Esau shall be stronger than Jacob. Esau, a man, a hunter of the field and Jacob, the tent dweller who had fair skin, Esau having very hairy skin. But he said, even in the opposite, things will be twisted around and things will be according to God's will and it will be upside down to us, but God's will and God's way, he says, the older brother, the stronger one, the dominant one, oh yes, he shall serve the younger. So, we enter this after Esau came in and said, I'm starving, I'm dying. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright. And Esau said, whatever, give me some of that red stuff. And he said, fine, you can have my birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. And he ate the bread and he drank the soup and he walked away. Some years later, now we come to this. We'll get into that in a minute. Some years later, there is now the rivalry that is still going on. It is a wife against her husband. It is a husband against her wife. 
It is two sons that are against each other. It is one son against the mother. It is the other son against his father. A house completely divided. But they're all looking for one thing. They all want the covenant blessing because they see the value of it. Have you not seen movies or stories at times where uh, the, the father has an untold amount of wealth and he dies and he has three or four kids and there's cousins and there's everything that's coming. And so now it's the time of the reading of the will and everybody is moving and jockeying for position even while the father was alive. Everybody's moving and jockeying because they want the wealth. They want the majority of the wealth. They'll do anything for that blessing of the wealth. And deception and manipulation and all of these things, perhaps even murders begin to happen. And all of this is present here. But before we judge them, before we come to this and even judge them, be cautious of your own life. For this is in your heart also. For this we can easily slip into one way or another. So let us look at this cautionary tale of what's going on here briefly this morning. Number one, I want to talk about in verses one through four, the presumptuous sin. That is the willful sin, the presumptuous sin, the willful sin that is going on between Isaac and Esau. Secondly, in verses five through 29, the longer part of the narrative, this premeditated sin of Rebecca, including her son, Jacob, the premeditated sin. And we see also here, number three, the predicament of sin. That's consequences. 30 through 46, and we think that even when we sin and we do what we do, we think that there will be no consequences. But we also think that if I receive mercy and grace of God, then I should have no consequences. We will see that the opposite is true. So number one, the presumptuousness of sin. It says when Isaac in verses one through four, when Isaac and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see. He called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, Esau says, Here I am. And Isaac says, Look, I'm old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow. Take all the weapons and go out in the field and hunt game for me. And prepare for me delicious food such as I love and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. At this point, when Isaac feels like he's on his deathbed. He's 137 years old. Isaac and Jacob here are in their late 60s to early 70s right now. They're not young men. They're men that were probably in their 60s, late 60s, early 70s, around that age. If you calculate the ages of Abraham and Isaac and their ages and when they had kids and so and so forth. Ishmael is now dead. Ishmael being 13 years older than his brother Isaac. And Ishmael died about 150 years old. But what's interesting also is that although Isaac is sitting and he's saying, I'm on my deathbed. And I don't think my days are long. He would go on to live another 43 years. He would live five more years than his father, than, than Abraham even lived. Isaac would live to 180 years old. Things are not as they seem here. Often in Sunday school hour, we portray um, um, uh, Jacob and Esau as little teenage boys that are doing this. But you have to understand these are 70, about 70 year old men that are doing this. Now, it is true that it's not the same 70 we get when we're 70 because they lived a lot longer. As it were, if you were to take it and boil it down, it was as if they were in their 30s because of the time span in which they would live. Obviously, even as Isaac was sick, he went on to live another 43 years. And so these men are beginning to come together. But Esau, 
and Isaac had one thing in common. Do you notice? It was a passion for food. They loved food. And even when it came to the point of Esau selling his birthright, what did he do? For food. And now we begin to see that in dealing with around the food, that Isaac loved Esau for his food, but Isaac's eyes were also dim, but they were dim both physically and spiritually. And people have asked this. I asked this question all, all day long and for a couple of days in studying this. And researching and researching, did Isaac and Esau know what God had said to Rebekah in this moment? That he would bless the younger and that the older would serve the younger. Was it just Rebecca? Did she keep it to her heart? And I kind of questioned that last week when we were talking. But I've kind of come to the conclusion, well, I've come to the conclusion in reading and reading James Boyce and listening to Sinclair Ferguson and listening to Joel Beakey and a lot of people that know better than I do because of their own research. I would conclude that, yes, the family did know that the blessing was to go to Jacob. Why do I say that? Why are they having a clandestine meeting for the blessing between Isaac and Esau? Because they knew that the blessing was to go to Jacob. You see, typically when the blessing is officially that Isaac feel like he's, feels like he's dying and that he's going to give the official covenant blessing and to pass it down the line, what would there have been a lot of? A lot of food, a lot of celebration, a lot of family, and a lot of people all gathered around. Why are they doing this by themselves? Strictly in a tent. Now they're in a tent and they're doing it by themselves. And he secretly says, go out, get the game, hunt it down, bring it back to me so that I might eat. And then I will bless you. And it was Isaac and Esau's attempt, understand this, to thwart the very will of God. Be careful when you play that game. To thwart the very will of God. Private conversation would have been, it should have been a public celebration, but they were doing it a secret. But why? Because they knew God's will. Isaac assumed God's role in thinking he could give the covenant blessing of God to whomever he favored. But that's not the way it goes. We don't give blessings. We don't give, we're not the giver of salvation. We're not the giver of covenant blessing. It is God and God alone. But he thought that, Isaac thought that he could definitely, because he favored his son Esau, because of his good food, that he thought that he could give the blessing to Esau when he knew that it should have gone to Jacob. Esau knew that he sold his birthright for food, right? He dishonored God and said, what do I care about my birthright? In essence, what do I care about God and all his blessings that he could have over me? I care nothing of this. I want my fleshly desire. I want the food. But then here he thinks he can buy the blessing with food. Selling his birthright. But now he wants to buy the blessing with food. I will give you meat from the field. I will cook it just like you like, Dad. But I want something in return. And I know that you will give it to me. And Isaac said, I will give it to you. I want the blessing that only God could give. They sought sovereign blessings of God by fleshly desires. How often we see in this world so many people that want and cry and deal with the blessings. I need the blessings of God and I will fabricate that. I will do whatever I have to do to get it. But I still want to live according to my fleshly sinful desires. And that is exactly what was happening in the room here. Number two, then we see this. This is going on in the room. It's wrong. It's trying to thwart the sovereign will of God that the blessing definitely should have gone to Jacob. God had already stated that. 
We often even see that with Abraham and Sarah, is it not? I will bless you. Sarah will have a child. His name shall be Isaac. And what does Sarah do? Oh no, God's not working fast enough here. We need to speed this along and go ahead of him. You're to marry Hagar. And then you realize the, the rest of the story of Ishmael and his rebellion against God in every way. Because they went outside the will of God. They sought the sovereign blessings of God by fleshly desires. So here now we see the premeditated sin. Rebecca scheming to force the will of God. Rebecca's listening at the keyhole as it were of the door. She's listening behind the tent when she heard this whole conversation. And she calls Jacob to himself and says, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game, prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord. This is what Rebecca hears with Isaac and Esau. But she looks at her son, Jacob, and she says, oh no, oh no, God's will is being thwarted. My own desires are being thwarted. What are we going to do? She begins to scheme and she begins to roll over in her mind. There are times when people sin in the sense of in the moment, a flash of anger because you don't like something or we snap or we do something because we've been caught and ensnared by sin. But then there are times we think it very carefully out. And here's the thing that we do. Sometimes it's revenge. Oh, my goodness. Why would any believer be thinking in any way of saying, how can I get back at them? How can I disinvite them to my life? How can I rearrange things? It takes a careful, thoughtful, planning, scheming person in knowing you hurt me. Now I am going to plan out how I'm going to hurt you. And even in this case, there's a thoughtful, planning, scheming way of Rebecca. And she says, I will not stand for this. When she should have, and she had every right to as a wife, though respect for her husband, she steps out of respect for her husband, the authority of her husband. She st steps out of the authority of God. He will accomplish his will. She should have done one or two things, going before the Lord and pleading with him, saying, I don't understand, Lord. You said it would be Jacob. And now I see my husband in there thwarting your very will and putting the blessing, trying to put the blessing on Esau. How is this possible? But nonetheless, Lord, I will wait. I will wait because you are the fulfiller of all your promises. It doesn't look like your promise is being fulfilled, but I will wait. I will try. I will not manipulate. I will not do anything. I will wait on you. She also could have stepped in the tent and looked at her husband and saying, why are you going against the will of God and getting into sin? This is all sin. And you know it, Isaac. How often a husband needs a wife that will sometimes bop him on the ears and saying, this is not the will of God and you know it and I as your wife cannot respect or obey you in this because of the fact that you are clearly in violation and in sin like it's the will of God. She also could have done this. But instead she schemes, she lies and she's filled with deceit Quote, unquote, and I'm just trying to bring about the sovereign will of the Lord. She calls her son to him. And she says to him, do not obey the voice of the Lord. What does she say? Obey my voice. Now, for my son, and she tells him to go out to the flock of the, the goats and to bring two young good goats to her. And she prepares this meal. She is the one preparing the meal. Um, she was the one also um, saying that your brother is a hair. Jacob actually says, but my brother's a hairy man. He goes, I I'm smooth skin, mom. How is this possible? I I There's an obvious difference between my very hairy brother and my really son. Uh, trying to understand that the fact that even his own skin is delicate and it's white and it's fair. He's a tent dweller, as it were. 
And he says, if I go in there and my father finds out, he will curse me. At this point, when Jacob is speaking, here's the thing. He's not afraid of sin. He's afraid of the consequences of sin. Yeah, but what if I get caught? And if I get caught, and see, there ought to be a clear delineation. Am I, am I afraid of sin and sin and deceit and lies and even trying to deceive somebody else? Am I afraid I'm going to get caught or I know that it's disobedience to God and I'm afraid of the consequences that I will have from God on my own sin? There's a huge difference. Because then you begin to scheme and plan and saying, if I was to get away with this sin, how would I go about it? And this is what Rebecca and, and Jacob are planning. If we were to do this, how would we go about it? Because even, even Isaac should have known the difference between the game of the field and two young goat meat. But there his senses are dulled and they know that his senses are dulled. His eyes are dim. So she puts the hair of the goats upon his hands and she puts the hair of the goat about his neck so that he can completely and try to fool his father. And he says, but what if he curses me and he finds out? And she says, then let his curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice. And at this point, Jacob should have done what? Mom, this is not the will of God. This is wrong. This would be lying, sin, deceit in every way. This will cause great harm to our family. In every way, whether it's the conversation, and it always happens in twos. It's Isaac and Esau. Then it's Rebecca and Jacob. Then it's Isaac and Jacob. Then it's back to Isaac and Esau. What's happening here? The head of the family should have said, that's it, everybody in the living room. We're going to have a family talk. We're going to sort this out because this is crazy. But it never happens. It's never a family that is united in seeking God's will and doing God's will. But it's all a family that is split in every way, deceiving in every way to get out of God what they can for their own fleshly desires. So he brings all of this stuff to his mother, and the food and the goats, and they begin to prepare in every way. And he comes in and he comes into his father, Jacob, now dressed in goat hair with goat meat. And he says, my father, and there's a number of lies and deceit. The lie is usually speaking the falsehood. The deceit is more in the goat hair where you're seeking to manipulate somebody's mind away from that which is true. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father in verse 19, I am Esau, your firstborn. Okay, why? I, I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat the game that you, your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found so quickly, my son? Because the Lord, and, and he brings the name of the Lord. Notice what he does in verse 20. He, now he's bringing God into this. And it is a blasphemous way in which he brings, because the Lord, your God, granted me success. Lie. Lie upon lie upon lie. And one lie has to cover another lie. Just so you know, when you get into the game of deceit and lying, it's actually a lot more work than if you just told the truth. Here he has to cover one lie. And by the way, when you do lie, just understand this. You will have to use 10 other lies to cover up your other lie. You will have to use deceit and manipulation and distraction in order to cover up your lie. And this is exactly what happens. And so in verse 21, then Isaac said, please come near that I may fill you, my son. I know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to his father and he felt him and he said, the voice of Jacob, your voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's hands. So he blessed him. But he says again in verse 25, are you really my son Esau? You see, now there's a point to where you could say, I got a choice here. I can come clean or I could just continue on with the lie. And he said, I am another lie. 
Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of the game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. And he said, come near and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said. And so at this point, even the garments that he's wearing was from Esau's favorite clothes, his best clothes, and his mother, Jacob's mother, puts his Esau's best clothes on him, even to disguise the smell of everything. And so he smells, and he smells Esau. He smells the game of the field. He smells the, the blessings of all the field. And then he comes down, and he blesses him. See the smell of my son. Is the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. Verse 28, may God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine and let the people serve you and the nations bow down to you. This is coming also from the blessing, covenant blessing of Abraham in chapter 12 in the first couple of verses. And the nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's son bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Gave him the blessing and Jacob receives the blessing under the the disguise of lies and deceit appearing to be like his brother Esau. So in here, there were four deceitful lies involved. Jacob should have not used deceit, but what should he have done? He should have waited upon the God's promise, even though it looked impossible. He should have waited. He knew the promise. But at this time, like Esau was more concerned about his own welfare than God's glory. More than anything else. How does this affect me? Is typically our first thought. And if this affects me in this way, how am I going to fix it? Will I fix it through fleshly desires and to make the outcome as good as I can? And to demand that people follow the sovereign will of God, even if I have to manipulate you and sin against you and all of these things? Or should I pray and wait and be careful with my words and ask God how I should approach this? But Jacob and Rebekah did not do this. And by the way, do not use sinful tools in order to correct sin in somebody else. Do not use sinful tools in order to correct someone's sinful behaviors. How often we give in to this, as parents maybe even, yelling at the kids, demanding that they do da 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 and you're seeking to bring about the will of God through your own bitter anger? It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. To manipulate your kids and doing or to manipulate your husband or to manipulate your wife and doing something that perhaps you would even consider good and righteous. But you have to come around in a certain way in order to get them to do what you want. You're using sinful tools in order to accomplish something that is perhaps even what you say is the will of God. You want the will of God accomplished, perhaps, but the way you're going about it is as if it's your own agenda for your own blessing trying to get it through fleshly desire. And so now, number three, we see this, the predicament of sin. 30 through 46 to the end of the chapter. Now we see that Isaac and Esau are trying to enter a covenant blessing that is not the will of God. They are using fleshly desire. They are meeting clandestine meeting that they're having by themselves instead of a full celebration so that they can accomplish this away from the will of God. God had made his will known that the younger shall serve, that the older shall serve the younger. And then you see Rebecca and she begins to scheme and she begins to plan out how this is going to go instead of going away and crying out to God or going in and yes, rebuking her husband for stepping into sin and out of the will of God and saying, this is not of God. God has already said and whether he repented or not was not her issue. It was to be faithful with the truth and to follow in that truth. 
And then she brings her son into her own deception and scheming, bringing another family member to pit against your own husband, to pit you against your own spouse and scheming because we've got to save God. We've got to save the will of God. It's all up to us. When you fact you should have just stepped back and waited upon the Lord because he will never go back on the promises that he has made. Period. And so the predic- it, le- it all leads to this predicament, this divisive family. And so in verse 30, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, Jacob barely gets out and there's Esau walking in. Barely gets out because I think that Esau probably would have killed him at that moment. God spared Jacob's life. Scarcely gets out of the presence of Jacob. Oh, excuse me, Jacob scarcely gets out of the presence of Esau. And he comes into Isaac as father. And he had prepared delicious food for his father. And he said, look, dad, arise and eat. For I have brought the game so that you may bless me. And immediately with his dim eyes, you can see just Isaac turning around and he looks and he says, who are you? I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate before you came and I blessed him. Yes, he shall be blessed. And violently, and it literally means shaken to the core. What just happened? How did this happen? How did I give my, my blessing to my son Jacob? How was I such a fool? How did I do this? Or it could have been, what am I doing? Even God is in charge, even now. That that person would receive the blessing of God. I cannot thwart the blessing of God, which is no excuse for Jacob's sin. But he could not thwart the very blessing of God. Isaac realizes that he blessed Jacob and not Esau. And Isaac trembled violently. But he should have been trembling violently that he was actually about to bless Esau. And perhaps he was. And you'll see some repentance in here. It is as if Isaac at this point is resigned to the will of God. Who was it that brought me this game and blessed? Esau, he's the one that's blessed. Esau, he's the one that blessed. But Esau cries out. And as soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out in verse 34 with an exceeding great and bitter cry and said to his father, Oh, bless even me also, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac said to Esau, behold, I have made him Lord over you and all his brothers. I have given to him for servants and with grain and wine. I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even also, oh, my father, isn't there something just left over for me? But Esau is weeping, as it says in Hebrews 12, not for a genuine repentance. He's sorry for what he has lost. And he's sorry that all the things that he wanted, and then even the birthright, and even the blessing, But God was there during the birthright when he sold his birthright to Jacob. God was there and saying, I see that you have no regard for the blessings of God. I see that you'll easily throw away the blessings of God no matter what for a cheap bowl of thrill, for cheap sin, for for the desire, the fleshly desire of food. Better to die starving than to give up on the blessings of God in Christ Jesus. 
But he gave it all away and it's affected him even now. And God had even made the promise. You know, I said, the blessing was to go on the second son. It's not to go to Ishmael, Abraham. It's to go to Isaac. It's not to go to Esau, Isaac. It's to go to Jacob. Everybody's working against the Lord here. And God's sovereign will and stepping in the way. It's a complete mess. And even Esau, when he finally weeps over, he's not weeping over his sin before God and saying how carelessly I have treated the covenant blessing of God. Look what I have done. I've given into fleshly pleasure. I have lied and I have tried to manipulate in every way. In fact, I tried to sell my father food for the blessing. But his crying and repentance is not real. Calvin says this, John Calvin, that the mind of Esau was affected with no sense of repentance appears this way because he has accused his brother and took no blame for himself. Sin always plays the victim, doesn't it? It always plays the victim. Even in Cain, Cain is saying after he murdered his brother, because his brother was worshiping God and God had rejected blessing Cain because he brought false sacrifices. Cain goes out and kills his brother. And God punishes him and he says, my punishment is more than I can bear as if I don't deserve it. Oh, how often we sin and sin and sin with no uh, paying no attention to the consequences whatsoever. But we always feel victim when the consequences finally come our way and saying, do I deserve this? Why is my life like this? Because you're a sinner and that many things that you do when you're lying, cheating, in every way, deceptiveness, you think that there should be no consequences and that there should be nothing against you. Because after all, didn't I receive mercy and forgiveness of God? Absolutely. But do you think there's still no consequences? There is. And many times they are lifelong as we are going to see. He, look at Esau. He carried the victim mentality. I am suffering consequences of sin because of someone out there and what they did to me. That lying, cheating Jacob. He took away my birthright. Actually, you sold it. He had taken away the blessing. Actually, you tried to buy it when it what didn't belong to you. But he blames Jacob for everything. The proof that is Esau's false repentance. He says, when my father dies and I go through mourning, the first chance I'm going to get, I'm going to kill Jacob. I've had it. I'm murdering him. Here's true. And Pastor Tom had read some of that this morning. But in the 1689 confessional, here is true repentance. The saving repentance is a gospel grace in which those who are made aware by Holy Spirit of the many evils of their sin by faith in Christ, humble themselves for it with godly sorrow, hatred of sin and self-loathing. They pray for pardon and strength of grace and determine and endeavor by provisions from the Holy Spirit to live before God in a well-pleasing way in every way. So this had nothing to do with Esau. In fact, it had nothing to do, this kind of repentance had nothing to do with this entire family at all. And ending, how are we to see this? How are we to understand this? This wretched family is, is going to produce the nation of Israel. And through this wretched family, there's going to come a savior. Oh, it gets worse. As we go on in Genesis, you have, as they say, you haven't seen nothing yet. You will find the despicableness of men in our own hearts. And maybe the Spirit of God is revealing even now that you've been trying to lie and manipulate and do things. And you claim that maybe you're even doing the will of God. But the way you're going about it is to produce the will of God by sinful fleshly desires, which simply becomes your own agenda to get the blessings of God without the favor of God and without God himself or his glory. So through all this, here's what we see. After Jake, after he says that um, I'm going out and I'm going to, in verse 30, um, 
excuse me, verse 41. Now Esau and Jacob, because of the blessing with which the father had blessed him, and Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father, which we're not going to be yet, that's 43 years later, are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob, which shows false repentance in every way. Murder. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah, and she sent and called Jacob her younger son and said, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about your own planning to kill. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise and flee to Laban and Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's anger and his fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away, and he forgets that what you have done to him, then I will send and bring you from there. Why should, you be, why should I be bereft of both in one day? But here's the consequences of sin. Rebekah finds out that Esau is going to kill Jacob as soon as the father, Isaac, the father dies. But Jacob knew that Esau wanted to kill him through Rebekah and he left for Laban and guess how long he's gone. He's gone for the next 20 years and he never sees his mother again. In fact, Rebekah, you never hear of Rebekah again until some chapters later that she dies. That's all you hear after this. Oh, the consequences of sin. Oh, the consequences of deception. She not only lost Jacob and never saw him again, but she also lost her son Esau. Isaac lost his son Esau. In fact, Esau would go on to the next chapter. He would go on to marry Canaanite women. And in verse 46, here's what Rebekah says about the Hittite Canaanites. I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be? She even knew that as Esau went out, he went ahead and he went outside the covenant. He did not humble himself. He did not repent, but he lived in a life of sin. And of course, when Isaac began to say the things over Jacob and this blessing, it was actually a curse. He said, by your sword you shall live, you shall serve your brother, but when you grow restless, you shall break your, his yoke from your neck. I, even Esau would go on to suffer the consequences. The whole family was now completely divided because of their sin. It is consequences. We never hear Rebecca again. It is a house divided that cannot stand. They lose the kids as a consequence of everything. There is no blessing foreseeable on this family. But why? What is the good news here? Yeah, right. What is the good news? We would give, go on to see that in Romans 9.13, as we saw, God said this, Jacob, I have loved. I will show mercy to whom I show mercy. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And Jacob running from his brother Esau because he was going to be murdered. You will begin to see in the story as it on goes, he goes to Laban. He's also being disciplined. Jacob is being disciplined by the Lord for some years. He's now going to be cheated. He's now going to be robbed. He's going to have to take his own medicine of what he did back in that camp. God would teach him through the consequences of sin. This is how God was taking him. Esau, God left alone. But Jacob, God's taking him even to a point where he wrestles with God. His hip is out of place, but he's wrestling with God. And he would wrestle with God for the rest of his life. But God was sovereignly having mercy. And God said, Jacob, I love you. In fact, do you know this? Sometimes the consequences of sin are harder on God's people than they are of the world. You will suffer heavier consequences because of the insistence upon your own sin than some people getting away with in the world because they do not belong to God. Oh, but let me tell you this. God will not lose you to the condemnation of this world. He will teach you long and hard that this is not my will. This is not my way. And God will guide you. He will hem you in and he will make you like Christ with much sin in your life and even much pain as he did here. As he did David. When he sinned with Bathsheba, then murdered Uriah, 
And even the difference between Peter and Judas. Oh, when Peter had denied Christ three times, he went and he wept aloud before God. What have I done to the Son of God? This is true repentance that he comes. But Judas, Judas was only concerned about the consequences he suffered. That's why he threw the 30 pieces of silver back at the Pharisees and he went out and he hanged himself because in suicide you see that deep-seated, rooted selfishness that goes on. Because you want nothing of God whatsoever. There was not true repentance. Here, the consequences of sin, as I said before, they're often harder on the people of God than those who do not belong to him. By his mercy, he will not lose you to the condemnation of this world. And here's what we could say. as a song I like to listen to by Shane and Shane. Our sins are many, but his mercy is more. How we ought to hang on that. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Because of the loving devotion of the Lord, we are not consumed. For his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Even our sin will not thwart the sovereign will of God, especially on his vessels of mercy. I am like Jacob. I am like Rebecca, Isaac, and Esau. It's in me. It's there. But just like he has mercy on Isaac, and just as he has mercy on Jacob, though he has to take him through the full consequences, not to love sin, but his mercy, his mercy is being shown out in our lives. Yes, we are deeply flawed sinners. We go against the will of God. We manipulate, we deceive, we lie. We want the blessings of God, but not God. God will teach us in every way that even when we realize our sin and it weighs upon us and what we have done, we understand this. His mercy over me is new every morning. He is guiding me on the path of his own righteousness. And he is molding me and making me to be like Christ in every way. I will submit and I will wait. For he is good. And he will fulfill every promise in my life. Let's pray. Father, again, we come before you. Lord, as we see even here, this whole understanding of Jacob and Esau and Isaac and Rebekah and all the craftiness and scheming and deceit and lying. Oh Lord, may we pay attention to Scripture. How oh, often we design our lives and even the world wants your natural blessings, Lord. Oh, they desire it. They crave it. They want to live in that joy of it. They, but they don't want you. That's the difference. They don't want to glorify you. They want to use everything that you have given to bless man. To use it for their own crafty, consuming desires of flesh. Whether it's sex. Whether it's drugs. Whether it's money and power. And all of these things. Oh God, may we back up many times. And be careful to what we say and how we are about to act. If we truly desire your sovereign will, we do know one thing. We must be faithful, we must be righteous, and we must wait for you to fulfill your promises and for you to fulfill your sovereign will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we fully submit. May we take this lesson. May we take this story, Father, of history. May we learn so deeply from it and be very, very careful not to take advantage of your mercy. Because you give us mercy, it doesn't mean that we should sin the more. God forbid, Father. You would forbid that. But it should drive us to humility. It should drive us to silence. And as Job did, to put his hand over his mouth and not speak for you, but allow you to talk through your word. Allow us to pray. Allow us to be righteous in every way, even as believers. 
Guard us, Father. Guard our hearts. Guard our minds. Guard everything about us. May we love you with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and strength. Nothing of ourselves, this wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. It is only Jesus Christ and his salvation. So, Father, may we think on these things. May we dwell on these things. That we may live in holy, uh, holiness in the new covenant, in your new covenant in Christ before you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.